Many authors dream of this situation. Publishers are fighting for your book. In today's publishing world, it seems like you almost have to pay publishers to publish your book, but that's not necessarily the case if you have a hot, hot property. And today, you're going to learn how Marjorie Wildcraft sold her book to major publishers at an auction. They were bidding on her book for the right to publish her book. And you're going to learn how, if she did it, maybe you can too. Hi, I'm Dan Janelle. I'm a book coach, developmental editor, and ghostwriter, and author of Write Your Book in a Flash. And if you need help writing your book, check out our services at writeyourbookinaflash.com. Now, let's get started. Hey, Marjorie, how are you today? Hi, Dan. Doing good. We, we go back a long way, and I'm, I'm glad to be hanging out with you again today. Yeah, we, we really do. And I'm delighted that uh, you wrote your book and you turned to a major, major success. Tell us, Let's take, let's walk through all the steps before the auction. How did you decide to write a book? What was your topic? What got you inspired to write The Grow System? Well, my background is, is my, I teach people how to grow food in their backyard. And that's a very, very niche business that everybody goes, oh, that's so wonderful. Somebody else should do that, right? It's, they don't really want to buy it. They all think it's great. Nobody really wants it. So it's a very niche, niche product. Um, I, my, my first degree is in electrical engineering and my second career was as a professional money manager. And I had no intention of ever, like, I didn't know anything about growing food. I was volunteering on a project to get locally grown food into the elementary school, which was a complete failure when we found out there were not enough farmers to provide even part of the vegetables. And I had this huge wake up call where I said, oh my God, there's only four days worth of food supply in the grocery store. Food travels an average of 1,500 miles. I was living in central Texas, surrounded by 20 million Texas armed to the teeth. And I'm like, this could get very bad very quickly. You know, like I've got to learn how to grow food and I need to teach other people how to grow food. And my friends and family said I was nuts. Like, this is America. You know, we're never going to have empty shelves on the grocery store or supply chain problems. And I'm like, sorry, I know what I know, and I'm going to work on this problem. And I, you know, sold my other businesses. And that's what I dedicated my life to. Um, and I'm going to tell you, it has not been super easy, because again, it's a super niche business. The first video I came out with was I'd, I'd had a class I was teaching people on how to grow food in their backyard. And it was 2008 timeframe, right? 2009 timeframe, people were completely freaked out. And my classes were getting way, way, way booked. And people said, you've got to make this into a video, which I did. And then that thing just went crazy. You know, we're talking 2009, 2010, and timing is everything. I did not know much about marketing at the time. And even though there was like a half a million copies that got illegally downloaded and spread around, which right now I'd be thrilled with, right? But at that time, I didn't put my name on it or my bit, anything. You know, it was kind of like a, almost this anonymous video. Um, but I, it told me that I could create content that could go viral because, you know, something, half a million copies back in 2009, that's definitely a definition of, of viral. Um, I was legitimately trying to sell it and I took a training a year long. And by the way, I really recommend coaching programs and experts and Dan, I've used your services quite a few times for helping me write, you know, uh, PR press releases and and I took this year long training coaching program on um, how to get publicity as an author by, you know, Steve and Bill, right? Uh, Bradley Communications. And uh, I thought, you know, book, a DVD, doesn't matter, same thing, right? Well, it's not. And in that program for a year, I learned a lot about media and publicity, you know, how to create a one sheet, how to pitch producers, how to get on shows, and more importantly, how to sell once you're on air. Um, you know, it's a year long program and we are learning that. And of course, you know, the value of, of media and constantly being out there because advertising didn't work. I spent a thousand dollars in advertising and sell five hundred dollars worth of product. That's not a sustainable model, but I could get on air and do radio and television, that kind of thing. Um, when I was in that program, everybody said, you should write a book. You should write a book. And everybody said, though, by the way, the publishers, that's a myth. You know, if you think you get a big publishing house you think your, your life is going to be rosy. It's not. They don't do any marketing for you. They really expect the authors to do the marketing. 
And I said, well, if that's true, why would I want to write a book? Because I can't even sell this DVD. <laughs> I mean, why would I want to write a book? And, and so I didn't. But as a part of that class, I learned uh, they had a system where, where they talked about the difference between a rich author and a poor author. And you know, one of the differences is a poor author really believes that their copyright is their most valuable possession. Copyright is nothing. Uh, and a rich author understands that you don't just write a book and sell it. What you do is you create a business that the book feeds to. The book is like your business card. It's not you know, you don't make money. I, there maybe are some authors that make money off their book, but the book itself is really just almost like a lost leader to introduce people to your business. So I said, okay, well, I have to build a business then. I, I needed to build a business anyway. I was very passionate about this. I wanted to create a business that where I had more products and, you know, treat how to treat infections without antibiotics or how to take care of your teeth or how to raise rabbits or how to, you know, all the things related to modern self-sufficient living. So I ended up building a lot of um, products around that and continuing to do publicity and building an email list and just really hard work. And when I felt like I had a big enough audience, I started looking for, by the way, when I was so naive, I remember they were talking about literary agents and I was like, wonder what that means, huh? literary and agent. Uh, I don't know, but it turns out it means somebody who sells your book for you, right? I'm like, oh, okay. So I went out looking for agents. And of course, every, you're getting, everybody gets turned down. And I went to some publishers directly and they're like, no, got a lot of rejections the way everybody does. Um, and, then, and then I said, well, I'm going to write my own book proposal. And I realized that what publishers want to see is somebody who can sell stuff. So like 90% of my book proposal was how I was going to market and sell this book. And it was all about uh, what I'm doing, which is uh, successful, is I've created a free webinar called How to Grow Lots of Food in a Grid Down Situation If You Know Nothing, You're Overweight and Out of Shape or Older. <laughs> you love that headline? You know? Love the title. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and I created this free webinar that summarizes like all my years of figuring out that. And I present a very simple system to them. And then a traditional webinar style, you, at the end of it, you make them an offer of the book, which is a bonus. And then a year's worth of training, which is the, the product that I have developed over these years. And so now, and this is something that I learned like from Jack Canfield or almost anybody, Russell Brunson, anybody who's successful at selling books, the book is a bonus and, and really now I have some room because the rest of it is a digital product that I've built. So now I have room to either pay for advertising, you know, get, you know, I've got maybe $40 a hard cost into this with the book and customer service and fulfillment and all that. Um, and now I have $160 to play with to try and sell this thing. Uh, and so now I can work with affiliates and offer them, you know, I, I offer them $100 every time they sell something, right? Um, you know, or I have a hundred dollar budget that I can spend on Facebook advertising or something. So selling the book by itself is really hard, but selling this webinar training package, which is free where I'm collecting emails and hopefully staying in touch with people and then eventually selling them this whole bundle has been what's been real uh, successful to date. And when I outlined that in the book proposal, I said, this is what I'm going to do. And then here's the list of affiliates I'm working with now. Uh, and I could show them that, you know, we all fudge our numbers a little bit. You know, like I had exposure to, you know, several million people through all my affiliates. Um, they're like, oh, this is great. Um, yeah, we get that. We get that she's, they also really like the quality of writing. And, uh, and I ended up with uh, Park uh, Celeste uh, Fine of Park and Fine as my literary agency. Oh, let, 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 let's stop there for a second. Yeah. Uh, to recap this, you grew, you, you found a niche that wasn't being served. You served them beautifully and word spread and you grew your list. You built your author marketing platform, which yeah. is so essential. So when you went to a publisher or an agent, they could see that you were the real deal, that you could reach. I don't, we talk about numbers, but we talk about thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. 
How many at, people at, are on your list? You, well, at the time, my active list was about 100,000 people. Okay, that, that's a very respectable number. Publishers start to take notice. Okay, now let's talk about the next step. Uh, do you write your book or do you find an agent first? Which happened first, the chicken or the egg? Um, I've actually written several versions of the book uh, okay. for different either publicists or different agents that I thought I was working for or what I thought I wanted to write. And I've actually rewritten the book, like major, totally different books four times before I finally and, and but I had I had written I'd outlined it <laughs> more than a few times. Uh, and so when I went there, I had a very good idea of what I wanted to talk about. And then, of course, once I did get hooked up with the publisher, we refined it all again. And that became what it was. OK, um, so let's talk about the steps you took to find an agent. You said you were rejected by many agents, as happens to all of us and publishers as well. Happens to all of us. There's no shame there. It's part of part of the business. You know, it's just not a good fit. Um, that's their loss. Uh, I mean, that's how, many, right. how many major books have that have sold millions and millions of, of dollars and been turned to movies were rejected hundreds of times beforehand? Lots yeah. of them. So how did you find an agent? You know, I'm trying to remember. I think it was more of just keep asking people, um, you know, who do you know? Uh, who is an agent? Um, this is what I've got. You know, who, who would you recommend? And um, I was kind of surprised they paid attention to me, uh, and but they did, and they took a look at what I had, and uh, so like I said, um, Park and Fine um, said, "Yeah, we'll we'll take this project on." Um, so right. yeah, so it was more just continually okay. asking, and, and and again, yes, I had tons and tons of rejections, tons of I could you know I have the classic I could wallpaper mm -hmm. a room with with all the things. Okay. So what value add did the agents provide to your manuscript and your proposal before you went out or before they went out and started searching for publishers? You know, they did not add a lot, actually. I wrote okay. almost the entire book proposal. And, and I had, what I did was also gathering from, I said, can you give me examples of book proposals? And then, you know, of course, through pro programs I've been on, they, you know, they have book proposal. And I was reading everybody's book proposal. And I said, you know, I took pieces from this and that and the other. And I said, well, if I were a publisher, what would I be looking for in an author? You know, and I wrote it specifically to a publisher. And actually, the book itself, almost, I think, to the publisher is almost irrelevant. You know, like, they really want to look at selling things. They want to sell stuff, you know. So. Um, I really heavily loaded the proposal on the front end with how I was going to market the book, uh, the experience I had developing products, testing products, and um, and why this book would be a success. Fantastic. Okay, so your your agent goes off and says, "Okay, we're going to find a publisher for you," and you're back in your house in Puerto Rico, just waiting for the phone to ring. Uh, what walk us it wasn't the, the, it the, wasn't the, quite the, like that date on what was going on did they uh, call you one day and say hey we have uh all this happening you know tell us about no, that no no it wasn't like that so i gave them the book proposal mm -hmm. and they just sat on it and they said oh we're going to workshop it or something they had some term where, where their team was going to look at it and, and take it apart and do all kinds of stuff and um you know parking fine is a pretty respect i mean they are they are like you know, look them up. I mean, I was actually kind of terrified I'd ever have to go visit them in person because their team meeting, like their clothing probably would cost more than my advance would ever earn. You know, I mean, they're just <laughs> Manhattan, you know, Times Square, you know, like that whole thing. Uh, so they're going to workshop it. And I, I had written the whole thing and, and they were going to you know, edit it, do whatever they do. You know, they were going to do their thing. And it started getting to be, this was in, in 2019. And, um, I do a lot with business intuitives and I'm also, you know, if you're going to sell growing food, there's three markets, the spiritual market, which never sells the health and fitness market, which you think should, but never sells survival and preparedness, which sells like crazy. So mm. I've been involved with it. And in, if you're involved in the survival and preparedness market, you're going to listen to every conspiracy theory on the planet. And you're going to be involved with all kinds of alternative media and all kinds of alternative news. And I had a heads up that something major was going to happen in 2020. I also use business intuitives like uh, 
card readers or you know, uh, you know, business intuitives. And I had a sense that something very big was going to happen early in, in 2020. Um, and sure enough, um, and so I'm urging, I'm like, I'm talking to them, I'm like, hey, you guys, let's, uh, you know, get your workshopping done. Like this proposal, there's something, we need to get this going. And, um, and they were like, yeah, yeah, we're going to workshop it. And then January happens, and February happens, February, COVID starting to break out in China. Um, and in March, it's starting to hit the United States, the market's crashing. And I said, look, you guys, they're from New York, so you can cuss at people from New York. I'm pretty sure it's acceptable. <laughs> I'm like, get your asses in fucking gear. Like, if you don't do something with this book proposal and get me stuff, then I'm going to find another agent. And um, they, they got it, and they did it. And, they, and to their credit, they, they, I said, this is the book. This is the time. Like, I don't have, we, this is it. This is the moment. Timing is everything. And to their credit, they just went ahead and used the proposal I gave them. And they went out and shopped it out. And they lined up um, 18 publishers that, that bid on the book. Wow, 18 publishers. That's phenomenal. Um, so how long, how did you feel when you heard that there were 18 publishers interested in your book? Well, honestly, I've never had a book published before, so I didn't realize what a big deal that was. And I thought that's, <laughs> I thought that's what always happened, you know. <laughs> but I knew the timing was right. You got to remember, we're talking about March. I think people are going into lockdown. People are going crazy. We don't know how bad this is. I mean, people are in fear and panic and mayhem. And this is a book about self-sufficiency and growing food. And it's a very warm and loving and, 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 you know, very, you know, a lot of great directions, but it's also a very comforting book, which would, I knew would be, you know, was appropriate and they knew it would be appropriate. And so, yeah, so, um, yeah, I was thinking maybe 13, 18 is a lot. I don't know how many that, I think that is actually extraordinary. I think it might be a record for them too, honestly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I didn't know there are 18 publishers around anymore. <laughs> I know, right? It was yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. So were there, there were competing bids? I assume there was competing dollars as well. We don't have to talk about dollars. That's very personal. But did they try to sweeten the deal with some other things beside money to make you say, why, why would you pick one publisher instead of another publisher? Well, you know, the, um, you know I was kind of naive going into it. And I did do, some friends of mine who are authors said, by, by all means, get an attorney. And I really recommend that. Get a, get a literary attorney. It's going to cost you a couple hundred dollars. But as you're going through this, it's, especially when you get to a contract. But the way Park and Fine set it up is they had the first round of interviews. And normally you would have gone there in person and they would have like hour long interviews. And they did, it's like a grueling week of hell where you're just speed dating. But because of the whole COVID experience, we were all doing it via Zoom meetings. And it took a couple of days and we were doing a half hour each. And it was really chaotic. I mean, I was trying to take notes on who I was talking to. And I was trying to feel into who would be a good match or who would be, you know, who would be a good partner or anything like that. And Celeste and Biden, no, no, that's bullshit. You're taking the highest advance. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the money. <laughs> it's all about the money. And I'm like, okay, I get it. So what they did is they did the first round and they got offers. And then they, what they did is they picked the, like, I don't know how many of the top five highest offers and they said okay you can go in a second round and rebid again and that's what they did and they just said no we're taking the highest offer i'm like okay <laughs> you know whatever mm -hmm. okay well congratulations you got the highest yes. offer so uh, forget the whole vibe and thing like that you know it's yeah. like and i don't and it was so confusing i didn't even know who you know when we got to the winner it was avery um which is, of course, there were quite a few, uh, what do they call them, sub-brands of Subsidiaries Penguin Random House. Of sub yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's a, a name Penguin, one. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, there were several Penguin House, and, and they all got together, and I guess they decided which one was actually going to go after it, and they did some internal debate or whatever. But yeah, they, of course, Penguin Random House. I mean, aren't they like, they're part of Bartlesman's. They're the world's largest English language publisher, So, and they have the deepest pockets. So if they want something... They'll get it. Great. Basically. So, yeah. Good. So, so this was February or March of 2000 or, or 2020 when COVID just hit. And here we are, we're recording this on uh, March 2023, three years later. How long did it take 
them to get the book out and into distribution. Well, that was a that was a requirement that I had with them. I said, "Look, guys, I know you are publishers and you are like dinosaurs," and I really did talk to them that way. I said, the "One requirement, if you want to bid on this book, is you need to be able to get this published within a year." Um, I'm going to get this book knocked out and I will deliver the entire manuscript to you by October 31st with illustrations and everything. Um, but I need this book published, which you can't do that. And that actually knocked a couple of them out. They said, there's no way we could publish something in a year. It takes us two years at a minimum. And I said, okay. Right. Well, we, we negotiated with some of them. I said, yeah, yeah, let's do line drawings. You know, photographs are way more expensive and time consuming. You know, so we, the whole book is line drawings. And I'm, I actually like line drawing, so that was perfect. Um, um, and, and you know, I, I, we, we were all in lockdown, so I had you know, basically <laughs> six months to write a book. What else am I going to do, you know, right? <laughs> so I was kind of like joking with the universe. Like, like, hey, universe, you don't have to shut down the whole planet to make me focus on this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But, but it, was a, it was good that the that the universe did close down the, the whole it's world for you for six months. Yeah, right. And, yeah. And, and, and and so you got the book out in six months. So it's a year. So you it's a year after you got the the initial bids. You're st starting to sell. How much? What did what did they do to help sell the book? And what did you do to help sell the book? Well, when they were when we were all dating, you know, right. I said, who, you know, who, before we signed the contract, I mean, I'm like, well, who, you know, can you show me examples of bestsellers that you've done, right? I want to see your track record. And they kept showing me James Clear, um, Atomic Habits, right? Really good book, right? And I'm like, okay. And I'm noticing that they must have some relation with CBS. And I'm looking at the media where James was. And of course, CBS is owned by Bartleman's. And I'm looking at, you know, okay, so they have the wherewithal and the resources. And they kept talking about that like that was going to happen for me and it did not they did not actually not do uh, much of anything we did have some meetings where I gave them a bunch of talking points and show headlines and you know the biography and the whole thing and we're but they never really I never really got any substantial leads from them at all hmm. uh, which really surprised me because you know the literary agent was like look you know if they're giving you a big advance they're going to they're going to actually. I was so naive in the very beginning. I was like, "Don't give me advance. You know, spend that money on helping me with promotions." I said, "Do not stop that attitude right now. <laughs> you take every dime they give you because you're going to spend it way more wisely than they will. And the oddly enough, the more money that they give you, the more invested in you they are, the more likely they are to help promote you. But honestly, they didn't do much of anything." I suspect, and to date, I've only sold about 12,000 copies, which I don't think is a lot. Like I, I really had wanted to sell like 30,000 copies by this time. And I'm continually ramping things up and revising it. And we're now in another situation where the timing is really right to sell food production books. Um, but, you, you know, I, I suspect that they're waiting until I get over a certain threshold before they really bring on their resource, they do have the resources to promote an offer. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I've been doing throughout the last two years, but they did, they did get it out and they it got out in May, uh, 2021. So they did get it out, which was kind of a little bit, not the optimal time, but, you know, so we sort of missed that wave a little bit, but, um, uh, gosh, I was thinking, where was I going with that? They haven't really done much. I think there is some threshold, like maybe when I've sold enough books that they've made back a whole bunch of money or something. But one thing I do is I keep in regular touch with them. So there's this whole team. Oh my God, it's so confusing. Playing we're in a, there's like 12, 15 people on this email chain of people that work for them in these different departments. I don't know what they're all doing. And then the literary agent and they change out people. So I'm always, but I, I make a um, at least... Every two weeks, I give them an update. Here's where I'm promoting. Here are the um, articles that I've been written up in. Uh, and here are some of the latest, you know, here's the book stats. Here's how many I've sold. Here's how many sold last week. You know, we okay, we've broken 300 five-star reviews on Amazon. You know, whenever I reach a milestone or something, but I keep in touch with them and I let them know all the time that even though this thing hasn't broken out big time, I am constantly working and hustling on this on this thing. So, um, I, I, you know, they, mostly all I get back from them are emails of like, 
we're on vacation right now, but when we come back, we'll respond to you. Like, oh God. You guys have more vacation, like you have more vacation days than anybody I know of, you know, but you know, whatever. <laughs> what, what a story. That that's amazing. I think one of the great things about your book is that it is evergreen, no pun intended. Yeah, and this, no, book, it is. this book can sell for the next five, 10, 20 years. I mean, growing is growing. Nothing is going to change. You can sell this book. You can be on home and garden television shows and food channel television shows and, you know, Guy Fieri and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, the, the number of food outlets uh, are, are endless. So uh, well, there are a lot of know, opportunities. For that actually brings market. up a point. When, when I was first talking to the literary agent, Park and Fine, and I'm like, why would you guys, they were explaining to me the thing, like, I think it's like uh, the the numbers in the publishing, and that it may be different now. They were like, if they believe you can sell, I think it was 30,000 books, then they'll give you a $100,000 advance. That's kind of the, you know, this is a business, right? And so they look at your social media, they look at your thing, you know, they look at all your connections, and, and then they, they that's how they decide. And I'm like, and, the, and I said, and I said, what are you guys? And they said, well, we won't touch a book unless it looks like it's going to make a hundred thousand dollars uh, if the advance is going to be a hundred thousand dollars because they get 15 percent of everything and i'm like they're like i said their team clothing probably costs more than fifteen thousand dollars in their photo on their website like <laughs> i'm like why are you guys even dealing with me and i know they deal with authors that are just huge and they said well we know that this book is a classic and what we are, we are looking at this as a long-term royalty play. Mm -hmm. We know that this book will sell consistently year after year after year after year after year. And so we're looking at you as like recovering, recurring revenue. Yeah. Yeah. I look at uh, our bodies ourselves or uh, what to expect when you're expecting. And these books just sell forever because there's always another group of people who need this information. Uh, and it doesn't go out of style. You, those books do get updated, of course, to reflect different times and changes, or whatever, which is good. But it's those evergreen titles can make a fortune. So good for you. Good the, for you. The thing is, is I really need to get this like up on a top of a list to where when it sells forever, it's selling more volume forever. <laughs> That's my <laughs> objective. And, and right now, the program that I have now is... Um, I'm looking for podcast hosts or influencers uh, that have large audiences and I pitch them and I say, and it's a little bit of a hard pitch. People don't want to do rev share. They want like, you know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll promote your stuff. If you give me $10,000, <laughs> you right. Give you 10,000. Like, <laughs> first of all, if I gave them $10,000 and most of those podcasts believe they have way more influence than they do, and they would not sell $10,000 with product. But and, and um, I heartily uh, second that motion too. I know a number of podcasters who are in this to pay for play, and I've never known anyone who got their money back on any of those things. They, 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 it just does not work. So a uh, big underscore underline, do not pay for publicity like that. It's a, it's a loser's game. So I'll give you my strategy. I mean, cause we're, we're all friends here. So the big, you know, Joe Rogan is going to cost a fortune or most of the big ones where it costs money like that. You know, I'm, I'm clearly not going to get on that one. And all I can offer is a rev share model because I don't have any money, you know, and I can offer you money for what we sell. So what I'm, what, what I'm working on now is finding 50 podcast hosts that have an average of like 100,000 followers, right? And 100,000 followers, that's a podcast house. It's kind of, you know, this is kind of like a, a pretty significant side income for them, or maybe their main gig and they have other side income. They're making some money off of it. Usually people are pretty loyal to them. You know, they've got a loyal following. They've been around long enough and people really listen to them. Uh, and in fact, 100,000 followers of somebody who's got a really loyal following is better than somebody who has a million uh, followers and they just have a bunch of followers really. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking if I can get 50 of these podcast hosts that will do a rev share with me um, and each one of them has 100,000 followers, then I would have exposure to 5 million people, which is a huge audience. And so what I do, I'm signing up these 50 podcast hosts and I take care of them. I'm like, hey, here's show like every month. Can I get on, I'll get on your show. And I'll help you sell the product, you know, and, and they, I get them a vanity URL so they can have their own, you know, 
icangrowfood.com takes them to the webinar so that we track everything carefully and then they can do those shout outs whenever they want. But I come up with a show and talking points for them every month of something very interesting. This month it's on eggs. The Wall Street Journal has just said, you should skip breakfast because it's too expensive. And I'm like, that's bullshit. I can show you how to have free eggs for life. And we'll do a show about that, <laughs> right? So let's do a show on that, right? And so I'm taking care of my podcast host. Now, hopefully this is the plan is to get on there every month with them to help them sell stuff. And over a year, if I'm on your show, you know, if you have 100,000 followers, chances are you know, only two, three, 5,000 at a time are watching. But over the year, they're all going to know me eventually, right? And so this way I'll become famous to a community of about 5 million people introduced by somebody they trust. And I think that that is a big enough community of people that I could really start to push uh, you know, book sales in a much bigger way. The other thing that's really important is timing. Like right now, uh, we're in food inflation. And I, you know, again, I use a lot of business intuitives and I've been watching markets and finance forever. And we are headed into more inflation. It's not going to go down and, and hyperinflation. And this is food is uh, an essential. And so for me, this is the time to absolutely um, take advantage of everything that I've been working on for so many years to build. So um, this is the opportunity. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. I'm sure a lot of our author listeners have learned a lot about marketing, promotion, agents, publishers, the whole system and the importance of niching and doing what you love and sticking with it for a long, long time. You really got to love your subject is what I'm getting from you because you started doing videos and people told you you should be writing a book and now you have the book and now you're seeing where you can create an empire. So it's a very emp empowering and inspiring story. Marjorie, how can people learn more about you and where can they buy your book? Um, of course, on Amazon. Uh, and if you want to reach out to me directly, I'd be more than happy to help anybody. My phone number is 737. No, no, don't, don't get phone numbers. People can't. Oh, really? Them. Yeah, Just no, I don't mind. Web, web addresses are fine. Okay. Well, um, if you head over to growyourowngroceries.com, that's where we have the free webinar. And uh, if you head over to grownetwork.com, we have a forums area and all you have to do is type at Marjorie Wildcraft in the forums and you can reach out, you can private message me there or reach me through any one of the forum threads that I post in. And I would love to, I'm more than happy to help anybody with what's going on. And, um, you know, uh, I really, yeah. Fantastic. It's very generous of you. And we'll have that information in the show notes below the video on our YouTube channel. Marjorie, thank you very much for being with us today. And Everyone listening, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, we have more than 175 videos on our YouTube channel to help you write your book in a flash. Check them out.